I would like to start my presentation with a short story. I went back home a few months ago and I stopped by my in-laws. So my father, uh, my mother-in-law is telling my father-in-law that you have diabetes. My mother and my father-in-law said, no, I don't have diabetes. So she kept insisting, why are you eating all this baglava and everything, all those sweets, you have diabetes. So I told them, why don't you go and get tested? So they disagree which lab should they go to. I told them, you know what, just go to both labs, let's see the results. <clears throat> so the first lab, the result was 150 for glucose. They went to the second lab, the result was 8.3. Anybody knows what happened? Exactly. Different unit of measurement. So, my topic today, I would like to focus on the area of harmonization. The dilemma of reference range confusion and lack of harmonization in the total testing process does not only apply to the average job. This is a global patient safety issue. We as laboratory professionals should work collectively to address this problem. My goal in this session is to share with you some of the initiatives which were taken by international organizations such as the European Federation for Laboratory Medicine, IFCC, the Clinical and Laboratory Standard Institute, to harmonize the total testing process. I'll share with you some of the measures which we took within our laboratory network to harmonize our processes. Hopefully, you can adopt some of what we have done in your setting. By looking at you, I know most of the people in this room, and I know that most of you are working in the laboratory network, so I'm very sure that this presentation will, will be applicable to the majority of the people in this room. Now, if we went to PubMed and we did a quick search in the topic of harmonization, and then we look back all the way to the 1990s, we're going to find only a handful number of articles that address the topic of harmonization. However, in the last five years, there is a big peak or a spike when it comes to harmonization. So what's going on there? Does it really impact us? I think the answer is yes, it does impact most of us. That's why we really need to pay close attention to it, because if we did not focus in the area of harmonization, that can really have a negative impact in our patients and also in our efficiencies. Let's start with some definitions. Harmonization versus standardization. It's confusing, very much like test versus validation versus verification. We have been talking about it for 10 years, we still don't know the difference. While the word harmonization and standardization used interchangeably in the literature, we always refer to the word standardization when we link it to a reference. By the way, I don't like, I don't like to use the metrology terminology because I'm going to say, unbroken chain to the highest reference and so on. Harmonization is harmonizing the process. What is good for me to harmonize might not be applicable to you to use and vice versa. But by the end of the day, you need to have a system which works in harmony and have a positive impact in patient care and efficiencies. So for the purpose of this presentation, when I'm talking about harmonization, I'd like to talk about harmonizing our process. We work, uh, our, I work in a, a network of laboratories. We manage a number of hospital labs for. We have four medical centers. Some of our staff are sitting in the back. We manage two different labs, one clinic. Very complex system, difficult to harmonize, yet we took a number of steps to do our best to harmonize. And I'll be sharing with you all the activities that we took and all the fun that we had and the outcome. At the national level, I was having lunch with our colleagues here. They came from UK, and they were asking us what is the local um, authorities that you need to comply with. And I just looked the other way because if I have to answer her, I'm going to be still talking to her about all the regulation that we have to follow. At the international level, ISO, CAB, we need to harmonize our system with CLSI. IFCC, AFLN, put anything letters together, we need to be in compliance with. At a quick glance, 
I want you to understand our background for those who don't know us. So I just have to put one slide to talk about us. We have 11 labs. In average, we have 18 inspections per year, usually my ISO, 5 cap, number of JCI, in addition to OSHA, and so on. So we are busy with the inspections, but I think now all of our inspections have been handled by the frontline staff. We rarely get to interfere with the inspection process as managers and directors. Our last inspection we had last month, three out of the four supervisors were off. Yet, the frontline staff did a fabulous job. We have an announcement of 800 tests. 200 employees. So it's complex. Yet we have nice most of our process and hopefully we'll walk you through what we have done. So very much for that our work uh, to harmonize the process while keeping 200 plus client happy is like changing an airplane engine while we are in there. It's tough work. So I selected six different areas to harmonize at the pre-examination, examination, and post-examination. For the pre-examination, we'll talk about blood collection and referrals. Examination, we'll talk about quality control and method validation. Then reference interval and key performance indicator. <clears throat> I have to give you a heads up. At the pre-analytic or pre-examination and post-examination, it was not too hard for us to harmonize. But at the examination, we encountered some difficulties, yet we harmonize to the best of what we can do. So let's start with the pre-examination. Blood collection, tube color. When you look at this lavender top tube, what will be the first test that will come to your mind that we need to run? CBC, right? Yes. How about if you see the same lavender top tube laying down in the microbiology bench? Is it still CBC? Okay. Maybe not. But now, I put two tubes. The picture might not be too clear, but the tube in the bottom have some gel in it. The tube in the top have powder. Two different tubes, two different preservatives, one color. Do you think that can confuse our specimen receiving department? It will. And the same with this rack. I took this picture in our microbiology department lab. If you look to the right side of the screen, you have two gray colors, gray color tubes, right? You will think it's for glucose, for my in-law, right? It is not. One for glucose, one for quantiferum. The same with the lavender top tubes. Two, to two lavender top tubes, one for CVC, one for quantiferum. And I think you know where I'm going now. Something as simple as the color of the two can cause a serious pre-analytical issue. By the way, I was going over my slides yesterday, and my little son Yamin was looking at me, and he loved all those colors. And he came to me, he's like, Daddy, what's your favorite color? I told him I like Hilal uh, Sport Club, so I like blue color. He's like, Daddy, what type of blue do you like? Light blue, navy blue, dark blue? I'm like, yeah, I mean, when I went to school 20 years ago, we only have one blue color. <laughs> and I think the same with the suppliers. They get overexcited in the last 10 years. They have way too many colors, way too many preservatives. I think it's time for them to sit together, make up their mind, to make things easy for us. A lot of articles were written about confusion when it comes to preservatives. And that caused many patient harm. Can we, as a network, um, harmonize the world? We cannot. But we can harmonize our network by enrolling with one supplier and buy all the, supply, all the supplies for us from one supplier. We distributed our network so our specimen receiving area uh, can receive all those tubes without having to peel all those labels. And you know how easy is it to peel a label from a tube? At the international level, we learned that the EFLM, the European Federation for Laboratory Medicine, are putting together all those seven major suppliers 
and they are asking them to harmonize the color of the tube and the preservatives. So hopefully in the next couple of years, they will come up with the recommendation. Then it will go to CLSI, it will go to ISO. Hopefully that can make it to a guideline or a standard. So I'm done with the first one, which it seems like it's not too difficult to harmonize, but please note if you are using multiple reference lab or multiple referral lab, you might struggle because then you're gonna have different type of tubes and that can create problem. Moving on, still we are staying in the pre-analytical area. Everybody have a send out department, excluded in some place where only one or two people are really good at the send out. And most likely your workflow will look very similar to this one. And here I would like to use the 80-20 rule. 80% of our problems come from 20% of our processes. And I think I'm going to the send out area. It causes a lot of problems. It's a headache. So we try to look and see if we can harmonize our send out department because most of you work in a network of labs and every lab will have a send out bench. So starting from physician queries, of course here I'm talking about specimen collection all the way to results coming back from your referral lab. Physician queries, let's say you have 10 different labs, should all those queries go to one department or it should go to you train 10 different labs on how to address queries? For us, I think it makes sense to go to one department rather than training 10 different hospitals on how to answer queries regarding to how to order a test. Collection manual, maybe it makes sense to harmonize it and have one collection manual. Um, test ordering. Of course, if you have one lab information system across your network, the test ordering process will be very simple. However, if you have multiple LIS, then it will be difficult. Specimen collection and storage, as well, you can have it harmonized, and you, maybe you can even have it in your collection manual. Pick up by referral lab, that's easy, but you have to work with your referral lab, but this is not um, the biggest area of my interest here. Then, how are you gonna put the order to your referral lab? Is it gonna be in a manual requisition? Is it gonna be via email? Is it gonna be via interface? And then how would the result come back? So as much as possible, we try to harmonize our uh, result ordering, the way it came back, and the easiest solution we found is full interface. To have a flawless, you have to have an interface. The last task that usually the responsibility of the send out department is the referral lab evaluation. Most likely, the referral lab evaluation is the responsibility of your send out department. So when we look into the different standard referring to um, referral lab evaluation, we look at the College of American Pathologists, ISO, JCI, etc. we found some similarities or some differences. So when we put together our policy, when it comes to referral lab evaluation, we have to kind of make sure that we address all of this. Many people forget, even if you have a network of lab, and then your, one, of lab, uh, one of your lab will send the sample to a flagship hospital or a reference lab, you wanna make sure that you conduct a referral lab evaluation, and then of course your flagship hospital, when they send out the sample, you need to have another one. So you can think about having one policy for the two, or you can have two different policies for referral lab evaluation. If you want to make it easy, you can just get the CLSI standard re related to the referral lab evaluation, and that will, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you can just adapt it, just make sure that you address the JCI, because many times we forget about the JCI standard related to the hospitals and the centers, because they have some referral evaluation re uh, lab requirement uh, related to physician privileging and so on. So now we're done with the pre-examination phase of testing. Let's move into the examination phase. So the pre-examination was easy. Examination phase, it's a little bit harder. So you're gonna start with quality control. <coughs> Look at this uh, slide. Look where we started back in 1988, when the world was so simple, when we have only one color, it was blue, and when we have to run only two levels of quality control. If the evolution of QC stopped in 1988, it would have been so easy for me to harmonize our QC practice across the network. 
But what happened when 2011 CLSI released the evaluation protocol 23 and they talk about all this risk assessment, risk management, the frequency of QC, the whole world started to change. We start to learn about IQCP, Westgard came up with the new Sigma rules, things becoming complicated, yet we were able to be in compliance with all of those requirements across our network. We all excited, and last year the ISO inspector came to us with the interesting question. The inspector asked us, okay, all of this is great, you guys have done a good job, what about QC stability? Then we talked to him, well, we never recall any question in the ISO that addressed the issue of stability. And you know with ISO, no matter how many hundreds of time you read it, you'll always have an area where you missed it. So he came up with this ISO uh, 5622, and he said, quality control material shall be periodically examined with a frequency that is based on stability. You see the word stability. How do you assess stability? Then we start to scramble. Huh. We ask our other colleagues in the labs in the area. Many of them get cited by the same citation, stability. So let me spend a few minutes to walk you through the process to understand how we can assess stability. And at the end, we can see if we can harmonize our stability testing across our network. First, we started with CLSI C24-2016, very interesting document. No matter how many times you read it, you're gonna find something new, very much like the ISO. So, in the second column, the frequency of QC, uh, CLSI said, we need to assess the workload. If my lab, reference lab, um, run 2,000 CBC per day, then my other lab, smaller lab run 40 CBC per day, should I run the same number of quality control? Maybe the answer is not. Because if you have any failure, then you have to rerun 2000 CBC. Age of the analyzer, something we never thought about. I think as the analyzer age, maybe the stability will deteriorate. Workflow pattern. Our reference lab run most of the samples after 8 p.m. But the guys in the clinics conduct 600 CBC, but most of them are done in the morning. Does one size fits all for QC? It will not. Decision criteria as well. And I don't want to go into the new West Guard rules because it's quite complicated, but this is something that we need to consider as well. We move to the cap to see if they have any guideline related to stability, frequency of QC. And in the hematology checklist, we found this checklist question about moving average. But the issue is, in this question, they said that the lab must conduct or perform at least 100, uh, 100 CBC per day. Well, that will apply to most of our lab, but there are a couple of labs perform less. So we cannot use this moving average, although the moving average will require, of course, close collaboration with the vendors to set it up for you and to decide on the acceptable difference on the drift to know when to rerun QC to make sure that your analyzer is stable. Then we check the literature to see if there's any good articles that can help us with this stability issue. I would call it a stability crisis, maybe. So we found three articles in the literature written in, back in 65, then Westgard have a couple of articles written in 84, in 96. They were good, but they still were not enough for us. We reached out to our colleagues in LabCorp. Then they shared with us this document which was published in 2015. And this document basically after LabCorp, because you know LabCorp uh, do a lot of samples every day, they decided that the magic number to monitor the average of normals or moving average is 50 samples. And in the same document, toward the end of the document, there is nice graphs on how they can monitor precision over time, which was very helpful. So now we have literature, we have CLSI, we have CAB, we need to make a decision to make ISO happy and to ensure that we have a quality lab. So we put all the options together. 
we went back to our scientific teams, discussed that with the technical director. Guys, we have four options. First option, conduct a stability study once a year, like just in one day, every two hours, do your QC, look at the precision, and then you are fine. You will tick a box, that's okay with ISO, but that's not what we are all about. It's okay for compliance, but this is a minimum compliance. If you'd like just to have the ISO certificate and hang, hang it in the wall, that would be enough. We looked into bracket QC. So for our smaller lab, we can run bracket QC. Because those labs, they work from 8 to 5. You can do the QC in the morning, you can do the QC 4.30 p.m. And if there's any issue, then you can do the corrective action. That will work with the smaller labs. Moving average, what's good about moving average or the magic number of 50 samples is really great because it's a real time. Every 50 sample, you have one dot. The next 50 sample, one dot. If all of a sudden your patient moving average drifted, then you can do QC and then, of course, you can, in a timely manner, correct your uh, quality issue. However, we can only implement this in a high volume laboratory. Westgard Sigma rule is good. We already started to pilot this in some of our laboratory. We get the Unity software. We started to purchase a number of third party QC. It's very good, but it still requires some work because of all the interfacing requirement. So to conclude, when it comes to stability, the best approach for your lab is to consider the volume, expertise, cost, working hours. It is not a one-size-fits-all. Moving on to the next area of examination phase of testing, I would like to quickly discuss, is it easy for us to harmonize test method validation or not? Also, the, the subject of test method validation have been hammered in the last 10 years. Every conference you go, there are at least two or three lectures about method validation. And I think also what is sparked the curiosity when it comes to method validation, when the CAB moved the method validation related questions from the general checklist to the all common checklist. Because in that year, in 2011, when they moved it, this is a study from the CAB, they found that the number of citations have doubled. So it, 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 it grabbed a lot of attention. So we went back to our staff to see if we can have one policy that can be harmonized across all the 11 labs. And we asked the, our team what kind of question that we usually see when it comes to method validation. So the common question we see, if we have an instrument have a UE approval, is that equivalent to FDA? What should I do if I move one instrument from here to here? And that happened a lot with our operation team. Every day they wake up in the morning, they decided the lab is not efficient enough, they need to move their instruments around. How about if we move this instrument from here to another department? Do I need to do full verification, partial verification? What is the total number of samples do we need to run to verify our tests? Common questions. Does the ISO recognize wave test? ISO does not care about wave test. You need to validate it or verify it, and so on. So message verification and validation, no matter how many presentations you attend, no matter how many documents you read, people will have questions. We check the CAB requirement. It's very simple. Everybody now is familiar. If you have an FDA-approved test, most of you have your basic chemistry, your basic hematology. You know, you know how to verify your test. So for a FDA approved test, we found that most of our supervisor, even the frontline technologists, can verify any new um, laboratory. We take over a lab on average every six months, and usually the frontline staff now, they don't even come back to us. They take the policy, and they will verify the method. We check the ISO. The ISO was quite interesting. When it came to method validation, the ISO said, performance characteristic of an examination procedure should include consideration of. To be honest, I did not read the rest of this because the ISO said should, which means good to have, consideration, another weak language. So I said, you know what? We might as well just get back to the cap because the ISO is not as stringent when it comes to method validation with the exception of the fact that the ISO 
we require you to verify wave testing. We went back to our scientific team in our lab to see what they have been doing in the last few years and what is their plan to understand if we can have a harmonized method validation policy or not. We found that in 2015 they went live with 252 tests. In 2016 they went live with a number of tests. But then when we looked into the FDA approval, we found that in the early years, we were going for an FDA approved test, a low hanging fruits, and then as the activity menu becoming bigger and bigger, they started to move into the area of laboratory developed tests, which require a complex validation protocol. And when we asked them, what's next? They said, we would like to bring mass spec, we would like to bring um, um, a number of lab developed tests. So they are telling us, welcome, welcome to the big boys club. So the validation is gonna be even more complicated because it's not a lab developed test, it's developing a test within your laboratory. We looked in the literature to see what's coming up. And it seems like the literature is leaning toward the fact that laboratory developed test market is here to stay. The number of lab developed tests or the value was 9.7 billion in 2015. It's expected to reach 14.9 um, billion by 2021. But for labs in the USA, they have to go under the FDA scrutiny. They have to be, um, if, if they did anything wrong, then the FDA can come and inspect them. Here, we are not under the FDA jurisdiction. But yet, we want to make sure that we do the right thing. So the good news is here, you can innovate when it comes to lab develop test. The bad news is, if things go wrong, you will be in the newspaper. I don't know how many of you have read this book, which was published just last year, in May. Okay. I did not read it yet, honestly, but I read just the summary of it. And this is one of my to-read list after MedLab. It's about a company called Theranos. I'm very sure most of you have heard about it. It was founded back in 2003 by Elizabeth Holmes. Theranos have a small handheld device that take a very small amount of blood and that can run a lot of tests. Just one drop, magic. You can have a lot of results. It's a lab developed test. Within seven years, Therano values, Therano's valued at one billion dollar. In 2013, they partner with Walgreen. They have over 40 labs within those um, uh, the, uh, drug department store to conduct lab testing. But it seems like they did not do the right thing. And by 2016, the whole Theranos thing is finished. So this book is not a science fiction book because earlier somebody was talking about, because they was talking about science fiction. These are real live story of a bad method validation or a method validation went bad. So to summarize the method validation, can we harmonize or we cannot across all of your laboratories? We found that in the two earlier, two lower circles, if you are a lot of uh, things before we come up with the reference range. So we look at the kit insert. Um, we check with LabCorp to see what kind of reference range they are using. We went to into our LIS because we have thousands of patient results. So we took the 95 percentile and we also put it there. We look at different age, different patient genders, and we shared all of this data with our scientific team. We also look at the publications. We look at the Calibri study in Canada. And I think our friends in Saudi Arabia have done a good job, Dr. Anwar and his team, working with the IFCC to do a reference range as well. So we look into that. And then based on all this information, the scientific team have to come up with the proper reference range for our lab, and then we use the same reference range across our network. So basically, you can do the same exercise, or if you'd like, just to tick a box, take 20 healthy individuals and make sure 18 out of 20 are within the acceptable reference range. That would make the inspector happy, but most likely that might not be the best reference range that you, you need to use for your populations or for your patients. Last but not least, KPI standardization. 
as a, refer, as, as a referral lab, many times you go to a client and we think that we have done a good job, all of our TAT are in, the rejection rate are in, we go there, we find that the KPI for us is totally different. We thought we are 95% compliance with TAT, they tell us we are 82. Rejection rate we thought is 0 0.3, they tell us no, 0 0.8. So let me walk you through what we have done or what a typical lab usually do when it comes to KPIs. Most of us, when we try to put together the KPI, we look into the CAP guideline or the CAP standard. They have a number of recommended KPI at the three phases of testing. We look into the ISO standard, the DAC-10, and they have a number of KPI. Most of it is a recommendation that you can look into. I think we are all together here. Most of you are accredited, so you have your KPIs. Then most likely, once we have our KPIs, we will go to the CAP Q track survey, the CAP Q probe to see what kind of benchmark that we need to use. Then we find that, for example, our rejection rate should be 0 0.5. But the million dollar question is, what is the definition of a rejection rate? Because many people will say, okay, rejection rate. What is a rejected sample? is a very difficult question that we need to answer. So what we did, I know this is very hard to read. If you can read this, most likely you have the eagle eye that he was talking about earlier. <laughs> but it listed all the 14 areas of rejection or so as per the CAP definition of rejection rate. And that's per the CAP Q track. So what we have done, we took those 14 criteria, we put it in our policy, we took the same criteria, we emailed it to the LIS coordinator, we told them that, you know what, whenever a lab technologist would like to reject a sample, I need a drop-down menu, and they only can select from this. It's a mandatory field. We did the same with a number of other indicators, because what we are trying to do, we are trying to align our KPI with the CAP, so that we can compare apple to apple. So we enrolled also with a number of our other QPROP initiatives. For example, blood culture contamination. If I ask anybody in this room, what is your target for blood culture contamination? They're gonna tell me maybe 3%, 2.3, etc. Last time I, I did a presentation about KPI and somebody came to me and they said, well, my blood culture contamination rate is 28%. It's like, wow, that's high. But what, what, what is your definition of a contaminated blood culture? Is it one bottle or two bottles? What is the list of bacteria you need to see in this to decide it's a contaminated blood culture? So the devil is in the details. My advice to you, as much as possible, align the definition. I know that by now most of you are accredited, you have your KPIs, but maybe your definition is not up to speed, align it. And I can go on and on, even critical results, outpatient order enter error. What is an order enter error? Is the demographic considered order enter error? How about if I put somebody at age 46 versus 45? Is that a big deal? How about if I put 46 versus 4? That's going to change the reference range. It can have a clinical impact. A lot of things we need to think about before we make decision on this. So, advice, what we have done in our lab just last month, we aligned our KPI definition with the CAP Q probe, Q track, we enrolled with those. We're going to continue to enroll with this to make sure that we monitor our quality over time to see what direction we are going to. I mean something as simple as our physician satisfaction survey. You think it can be harmonized? Sometimes it can if you have all of them are hospitals. Okay, but for us, our satisfaction survey, we have labs that they send out to, so the way we structure it is, might be different than a physician satisfaction survey for a hospital that we manage the lab in. So it's not easy to harmonize, but yet you can have the hospitals having one survey, the clinics having one survey, and so on. We also start to look into the CAP performance analytic dashboard, which just came out by the CAP last year. And basically, it monitored two indicators, your proficiency testing performance and the deficiency rate. And it's a good indicator as well to kind of compare your performance to a similar size labs, um, which is accredited by CAP. 
why are we doing all of this when it comes to KPI? What's happening in Abu Dhabi very soon is, of course, most of us are familiar with the Jodeh initiatives. Jodeh is Arabic word, means quality. So now they have about more than 90 indicators. Most of it is a hospital related indicator. They have only maybe one indicator related to lab. But once they reach a level where they need to have more indicators, our system or our KPI will be already harmonized so that we can compare apple to apple and then we can be aligned with the international uh, standards when it comes to um, definition of indicators. This is my last slide before I close. Other harmonization initiatives we're gonna be looking into, test panel. What tests are included in your renal panel? It might differ from one hospital to the other. What tests are included in your liver profile? in your basic metabolic panel. We want to make sure that the same component of the test is used across our network, and I know that the EFLM is working in the same initiative. Test name is another initiative. CBC, so complete blood count. FBC, full blood count. Is there any difference? Maybe not. Then why do we have two different initials? Interpretive comment. Something as simple as a CBC, we don't like to have different uh, pathologists or different technologies having a free text. It makes sense maybe to have a can comment, so people will select the same comment across your network to make sure that we kind of produce a harmonized results. I know if I want to go to the area of anatomic pathology and I tell them to harmonize, this is going to be quite difficult and this is not an area that I'm good at. Last but not least, something as simple as clinical reportable range. Here I'm not talking about AMR, but reportable range. Sometimes we find that within our network, if I have a high, for example, CPK, in lab A, they will make a dilution up to 1 to 5. But lab B, they will make a dilution up to 1 to 10. So why don't we have all of them use 1 to 10, maybe? So what we need to do as well next is to look into this document, establishing and verifying an extended measuring interval through specimen dilution and spiking to see the guideline related to this and to have a harmonized CRR across our network. In summary, we all need to work on harmonization. It's very important for us in terms of patient safety, in terms of efficiency. We need to harmonize within our laboratory network. We need to align our policies, our procedures, our processes with international guidelines, such as CAP, CLSI, uh, EFLM. We need to align what we are doing also with the local uh, bodies, again, such as DOH, ENAS, DHCA, etc. Because I think if we have a harmonized process, it's gonna make it so easy for a country like the UAE to have one EMR. I think most of you are now familiar with the initiative in Abu Dhabi, the HIE, the Health Information Exchange, where they're going to interface all of the hospitals with one system, the DOH. And I think, most likely now, knowing that we all have different test names, different panels, different interpretive comments, it's going to be hard to harmonize, although over time it will happen. But what I advise you is to try to harmonize your system so that when we all need to be connected together, we do compare apple to apple. Thank you very much.